Well, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. I think we have seen a broad spectrum of, of, of uh, presentations and it will not be easy to comment on all these presentations, but uh, I, uh, ab I'm absolutely sure that Patricia Houdin will lead us through all these presentations and give her opinion on this stuff. Thank you. Yes, I think you got the easier job, Herman, by introducing people and leaving me to uh, summarise what they said. Um, but first of all, just to thank the speakers for really clear and well-presented uh, talks that all kept to the time schedule as well. So thank you for that. Um, I thought what I'd do, um, just to remind me, because what we started with, uh, is go through the, the various themes that the talks have raised uh, and then just highlight a couple of issues that I think we, you know, worthy of uh, much greater uh, discussion. Um, so the first talk really was on screening and obviously the, the need to develop a quick, reliable and probably above all cheap screening tool has become one of the holy grail of um, uh, autistic diagnostic research, I think. Um, and I think as the first talk showed, um, instruments have become much better at avoiding false positives. So I think these days the children who are identified by good screening instruments generally will be found um, on the whole to um, either have autism or some other form of, of serious developmental disorder. Um, so uh, work in that area is uh, improving but I think there still is a major problem of false negatives uh, that is missing those children perhaps because they're very young or more able or because their problems are more complex or possibly more, more subtle um, that the, the screening instruments tend to um, not to be able to identify um, them clearly uh, and clearly this is an area that, that does need a lot more research but I think it's also very important although um, looking for good screening tools is, is essential that these will never be a substitute for expert uh, clinical um, assessment and observation in uh, coming to conclusive diagnoses. Um, the, I think the next talk illustrated the, the need for both not just instruments but methodologies uh, to distinguish between uh, subgroups within the autistic spectrum and that, that was really a theme of the following talks as well. Um, and I think that these various experimental uh, paradigms uh, are illustrating how the subgroups within the autism spectrum uh, do have certain aspects in common in the, in the way in which they um, function and, and deal with experimental situations, but nevertheless at the same time they can differ in important ways. And I think this type of experimental work um, can sometimes sound a bit sort of arcane and a good way of keeping academics in work. But of course, these neat, nice distinctions are important to ensure that um, children are, are accurately diagnosed, um, but more importantly, that their particular profiles of skills and difficulties are recognised, because this is, is going to be crucial uh, if they're going to get an appropriate uh, educational um, an intervention support. Um, the um, talk by Dr. Biscaldi, um, I think, was, was also important in illustrating the, the many similarities between uh, actually not just uh, um, children with Asperger's syndrome and high functioning um, autism, but also many similarities with the lower functioning autism groups as well. Um, and the, um, the uh, I think she illustrated that there are many more similarities than are sometimes suggested, um, usually on the basis of little empirical evidence. Um, but at the same time, that talk uh, picked out differences in the, in the uh, subgroups, uh, which seem to be uh, specific to them, which again, um, these findings have important um, applications for, for intervention. Um, I thought the other thing that was interesting in that talk was that her findings on, on um, 
the diagnostic process that parents go to go through uh, really very closely parallel the uh, findings in a, a UK study some years ago which unfortunately is still showing um, that children although parents are recognizing symptoms early on uh, professionals may be much slower in, in, um, in doing that um, and then um, Moving on to the final talk, I love the hippo. I thought the hippopotamus was fantastic. Um, but uh, actually also using that sort of statistical approach is important because that tends to get away from the, these biases that come in when people are, are, have their predetermined groups um, and then lo and behold find there's differences between them. So really much more sophisticated statistics it is important. Uh, in uh, really trying to tease out whether there's differences. Um, and I think um, also that talk uh, picked up on an issue that had come out earlier um, in that the age of the sample can, af uh, can affect your interpretation of uh, data. Um, and I think, again, that talk uh, and um, the themes touched on in other talks uh, showing that uh, the importance of trying to identify uh, different predictors of outcome. Um, past studies have tended to say, well, early language and IQ are reasonable pr predictors in that there's some correlation usually between early language and, uh, early IQ, and IQ in terms of later uh, outcome. But, but clearly they don't predict everything and it's only when you um, do much more complex analyses that you see the picture is, is much more complex and um, that, that there are many other factors operating. Okay, so I think that's a, hopefully a reasonable summary of the various themes that came up. Um, and the, the, but there's a number of issues that I'd, I'd like to, to raise and perhaps they might become... Um, focus of some of the subsequent discussion. Um, one of the things that was picked up on, um, I, I think with, um, not quite sure, I think Dr. Biscaldi's talk, on the, the importance of longitudinal studies, following up people over time, because that's really the only way in, in which one, one can track um, progress and to some extent predictors. I think cross-sectional studies are important, um, but they aren't a substitute for longitudinal research because there's always uh, problems in drawing conclusions, say, for example, about cognitive change or even cognitive uh, decline if you've got small groups of different, uh, at different ages. Uh, you don't know that the small group at age five is actually really very similar to the other small group you've got at age 15. Um, so the really, as well as uh, cross-sectional studies, there is a need for longitudinal research, but of course that's much more expensive. You lose subjects, you lose participants along the way, and it's very difficult to get funding for longitudinal studies, but really, in many ways, there's no substitute for them. Um, the other issue that I, um, just from personal perspective, wanted to pick up on was the use of um, the, the term or the diagnosis of PDDNOS, because clearly this is used in very different ways in, in different countries. Um, we, it's used a lot in the US, but I think certainly Peter Satmari tells me it's used much less in Canada and uh, he, um, you know, it's only over his dead body that he will use it, or at least in very exceptional circumstances. It's used very little in the UK, um, but is used more in, in other European countries. And of course, within the DSM ICD, uh, manuals, it's sort of only allotted a few lines of cat uh, category that doesn't quite fit with the others. Um, and I think the, the use of, of this category um, and how valuable it is and why there's such differences in its use in different countries is an is a, a, a interesting uh, issue, I think. And then um, finally, Herman, you, you asked me if I'd comment on whether there was a difference between Asperger's syndrome and high-functioning autism anyway. Um, and I think uh, the sorts of studies we, we've heard today, looking at the issues from very different perspectives, 
really illustrate that the similarities, uh, in my view anyway, far outweigh the differences. And of course some of the differences when you're looking at older children may be due to the fact that they started off rather differently. Some had got language and some hadn't. And again, um, you know, the views of people like Peter Satmari is that the uh, early differences may have a long-term impact on some aspects of their functioning, but on the whole, once language develops, the two groups are, uh, are really very similar. Um, so I think that um, you know, we've got much better at distinguishing between children with autism spectrum disorders and children who don't have autism spectrum disorders, but we're l much less good at distinguishing between the, di the different um, subgroups with, um, within the autism spectrum. And I guess one question there is, um, how hard should we try to do this? Is this doing the individuals with an autism spectrum a disservice by putting so much research in this area? Um, or is it um, a strand of research that is very important because actually identifying differences as well as similarities may be very important in ensuring that, that all children, of course it's a very heterogeneous group, uh, ensuring that, that all children get the specific and individualised help they, they need. So I'll um, stop there. I hope that wasn't too garbled a rendition of very complex findings and perhaps um, open it up to discussion. Okay.